Hi, everybody. Would you turn to 929? Tonight is potluck, so please make plans to be here for that. There's always a good time we have, and and uh, so make plans to be at potluck tonight. 929. The one update that I will tell you, uh, Sandra Jones is doing a little better with her eyesight. She drove to go see Dr. Ali Zaga, and she... Uh, she was turning on Kirkland Road. She lives on Kirkland Road. And when she did, she uh, said Kirkland Road completely changed. Did you know that, Jackie? And then she says it was a little scary. And so anyhow, she uh, she uh, said that she got to see him. She didn't tell me how, how things went. I assume everything was fine. And then she told me that Dr. Adizaga is retiring in July. And so uh, there's not one... Uh, they don't have a dermatologist yet, so maybe they'll get one. 929. Father, we love you. We worship and adore you. Glorify your name and all the earth. Glorify your name. Glorify your name. Jesus, we love you, we worship and adore you, glorify you in all the earth, glorify your name. Glorify your spirit, we love you, we worship and adore you, glorify your name in all the earth. Glorify All day long of Jesus I am singing. He's my joy, my hope be. All the while he keeps my heart bells ringing. For his love is everything to me. He's my king and oh, I dearly love him. He's my king, no other is above him. All day long. In raptured praise I sing, He's my Savior, He's my King. Streams of love around my soul are flowing, from His heart loves everlasting spring. That is why my faith in Him I'm showing, that is why an endless song I sing. He's my King, and oh, I dearly love Him. He's my King, no other above him all day long in raptured praise i sing he's my savior he's my king in his light i'm going home to glory with the souls who trust his saving grace going home to sing and tell the story in the blessed sunshine of his face he's my king and oh i dearly love him he's my king no other is above him all day long in raptured praise i sing he's my savior he's my king 682 682 682 
To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Great things he hath done. Great things he hath taught us. Great things he hath done. And great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder our transport when jesus we see praise the lord praise the lord let the earth hear his voice Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he had done. 75. Before we partake of the bread this morning, 75. Up Calvary's mountain, one dreadful morn, walk Christ my Savior, weary and worn, facing for sinners, death on the cross, that he might save them from endless loss. Blessed Redeemer, precious Redeemer, seems now I see him on Calvary Street. Wounded and willing for sinners pleading, blind and unheeding, dying for me. Father, forgive them, thus did he pray, in while his light blood flowed fast away, praying for sinners news while in such woe no one but jesus ever loved so blessed redeemer precious redeemer seems now i see him on calvary's tree wounded and bleeding for sinners bleeding Blind and unheeding, dying for me. Oh, how I love him, Savior and friend. How can my praises ever find in? Through years unnumbered on heaven's shore, my tongue shall praise him forevermore. Precious Redeemer, precious Redeemer, seems now I see him on Calvary's tree. Wounded and bleeding, for sinners bleeding, blind and unheeding, dying for me. And Father, we do thank you for being the wounded, bleeding, dying, and resurrected Savior. Father, we thank you so much for devising the plan. Thank you that there was only one person and one way that that plan could be fulfilled. When he was born of a virgin woman, planted by the Holy Spirit, living about 33 years, teaching of volumes and volumes during those three years of ministry or approximate three years of ministry, then being humiliated, spit upon, reviled, rebuked, all because he loved us and you love us. And there was only one way to do it. Your will be done. 
Father, thank you for the many examples we have in your word. And as we observe the unleavened bread, which is to our minds, Jesus' body, we do it in remembrance of him. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. Nine hundred ten. Before we take the fruit of the vine, nine hundred ten. Nine hundred ten. Boundless love, unending joy. This is my life. It's what I know. I can't believe that he selected me. Jesus, my Lord, it's you I owe. Boundless grace. Because of Calvary, his life he gave, his love outpoured. I now can live with him eternally. Jesus, my Lord, it's you I owe. And Father, we do thank you and we do owe you. But Father, we can never repay that debt. That's where grace kicks in. And Father, we thank you that you're merciful. That's where you treat us less than our sins deserve. And Father, that's all possible because of our attorney, our intercessor, and our, our mentor, our, our mediator. Father, we thank you for the example that he left and that he looks forward to doing this communion service again when we're all in, in heaven for eternity. Father, it's with an honor and privilege that we come before your throne of grace. And Father, we do this in remembrance of him. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. Fifty-nine. 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 Break thou the bread of life, dear Lord, to me. As thou didst break the loaves beside the sea, beyond the sacred page, I seek thee, Lord. My spirit pants for thee, O living word. Bless thou the truth, dear Lord, to me, to me. As thou didst bless the bread by Galilee, then shall all bonded cease, all fetters fall, and I shall find my peace, my all in all. Would you please mark 207? 207.
And then when you have that, Mark, would you please turn to John chapter 21? 207 and then John chapter 21. I used to impersonate people that were older than I was, not intentionally. It's just what I did. And I could hear the old timers saying things like, now that coffee is cold and you need to go make another pot. My daughter and I have a vehement debate whether coffee should be cold or hot. If I knew that I could make billions of dollars off of cold coffee, I'd have done that a long time ago. Now, some newer, older people used to say, you need to throw that in the microwave. That's just too cold. Or they would say something like this. Well, I've seen everything. Only to be shocked that you haven't seen everything. That you, there are things that you're going to see, whether good or whether bad, that are going to take place. Jesus spent the first 30 years of his life providing for his family with the exception of one who rejected him. With his brothers and his sisters, they rejected him. They were so embarrassed by him. And finally, when he got to be about 30 years old, according to Luke chapter 2, that's when he started his earthly ministry. And it lasted about three years. But I want you to look at the very last verse of the Gospel of John. And when I say I've seen everything, I haven't seen everything. And this just blew me away the first time I really got a hold of it. And these are many, and there are many other things Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that could be written. Amen. Now, some people argue with that word suppose, but you got to remember that these men, these eight New Testament writers and the 32 who wrote the Old Testament are inspired of the Holy Spirit. They do not write anything that is wrong. Now, the Holy Spirit didn't do like Mrs. Gunkel did to me when I was in school, and she would transcribe, take my hand and force it this way and this way. And I'll tell you, I have pretty decent handwriting compared to most men, uh, but I don't have great handwriting like my wife and daughter. And, and my son writes pretty well, too. And so there you go. But nonetheless... The Holy Spirit made sure everything that was in there was right. And last week, we saw one of the greatest events that we will see in a long, long time. And that is the eclipse. If you got out there with your dark glasses, if you, if you were like us, you got your T-Mobile dark glasses, or if you had your welding helmet, you got out there. I watched a guy the other day, and he was putting it through his welding helmet, we got to see a show, even though we got only 75% of it. But then it broke my heart, and it bugged me that there were some people in the name of God turning around and saying, well, now, you see, this is a sign that Jesus is coming. Do you know that they did the same thing in 18, about 1843? You're still here, aren't you? I'm still standing, huh? I'm like uh, uh, Elton John. I'm still standing. And I didn't know this. I learned something today. That the Jehovah's Witness who started the 
modern day idea of the rapture and all that business is false doctrine predicted the end of the world would be 1984. You're still here, aren't you? And people have tried and tried and tried to predict when he's coming. And the reason they do that is two reasons, at least. One, they'll get their life right just in the nick of time. And the other is to prove they were right all along. But if you go back to John chapter 5 and verse 36, John says, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit in Jesus is talking, he says, I have a greater witness than John's, talking about John the Baptist, for the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. In other words, all of the signs that are spoken of concern only one individual, and that's Jesus. That is not predicting when he's coming because he himself says in John 20 or Matthew 24, 35, he doesn't know when he's coming. I know a lot of people have argued, well, that was because he was a human being. No, he was still the son of God. Only God the Father knows when he's coming. And so John tells us, in his gospel alone, we're going to stay in John as much as we can. The first sign that ever happened was he turned the water into wine. I know how many jokes have gone around about somebody driving drunk or driving with, a, uh, uh, like the preacher, you know, he was late for an engagement and he was speeding and the cop said, well, what's that in, the, in your seat? And he said, it's a bottle of water. And he said, can I see it? And he said, sure. And the cop opened it up. Whoo, had the foulest alcohol smell. And he says, he said, no, preacher, that's wine in that bottle. And the preacher goes, praise the Lord, he done it again. No, that's not really true. But Jesus is probably the one who doesn't like to go to parties. He's not like Slimer on The Real Ghostbusters. One of my favorite cartoon series was, and he always would say, party. Jesus goes to a wedding party, a wedding feast, and he's sitting over there and probably in the corner, not even paying. I mean, nobody's paying attention to him. And in the second place, he likes it that way. And they run out of wine. And so Jesus, so Mary goes to him and says, we've got to have new wine. And Jesus says, and I love the way he puts it, because somebody said he was being rude and disrespectful to his mother. No, he wasn't. He's the son of God. And he says, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? And so he orders them to bring water, and he turns it into wine. And then the wine, the, the master of the of ceremony says, man, this is better than what we had before. Now, this is the first miracle Jesus ever did. And you can put in there, too, the synonym for a sign is a miracle. Same Greek word, same Greek idea. And what this proved was that Jesus is the creator. Go back to the very first four verses of the book of John. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God, and the word was God. And without him, nothing was made that is made. He's the creator. He's the creator. Number two, the second sign was in John chapter four. He's got this nobleman who comes to him. He's not a Jew, by the way. He's a Roman. He comes to Jesus and he tells him, you've got to come and heal my son. Aren't we like the nobleman? Now, you see, Lord, I want you to come, but I want you to come the way I want you to. And Jesus refuses to go with him. Panic is starting to set in this nobleman's son, or nobleman, because he's got a sickness that is going to kill him. We're not told what it is. But when he does look at the nobleman, you talk about an act of faith. He tells him, go your way. Your son 
has been made well. All he did was spoke it into existence, spoke it. Man, I would love that if I could just speak things into existence. Maybe I wouldn't, but sometimes when you want it quiet, I, I hear the ringing in my ears and sometimes I want to go, hello, because I hear noise all day. And then when I get up in the morning, it's like, I turn the television down. I think I'm going crazy because I had the television on 45 and, and then I turned it down to about 18. And the longer the day goes, guess what? I got to turn it up a little more and a little more and a little more. And when that nobleman goes home, his servants run to him and said, your son's okay. And he said, what time did that happen? And they told him what time and the nobleman knew it was the very second and the very minute and the very hour that he said, go your way. Your son's been made well. He didn't have to be right there present. He didn't have to be there physically. We're going to look at another story in a little bit that, does, that they think that he's got to be there physically to heal. They don't believe anything he says anyway. And he convinces them by his actions. You see, he's the Savior. We need a Savior. There's a song I want us to learn, and it's kind of hard because it's got an alto lead on it. And I'm not trying to be disrespectful to alto people. It's just the key is one thing, and the way I heard it, boy, that guy, he gets after it. He's like me. He gets after it. You know, he's got it way up here. This life is filled with sorrow and troubles here below. We're often made to wonder just why it should be so. In every tribulation, this life must bring to view. Oh, Lord, we need a friend like you. We need a Savior. He proved he had power over sickness. Oh, don't we wish that sometimes... We, he'd just wave a magic wand and we wouldn't feel as bad as we do or, or we wouldn't feel as awful as we do or or Christopher and Brienne were giving me a hard time the other day because I was a moaning, moaning. Doc Morris worked me over pretty well and I didn't moan as much. Thank you, Doc. And I was still, hey man, I was still catching myself a little bit out of habit. Oh, I wasn't supposed to say that, was I? We had an elder here one time. I laughed and laughed. He did not want to spend $3,200 on hearing aids. You ever know the phrase that says, uh, rule number one in the house, I'm the, I'm the man of the house. Number two, she's the woman of the house. And the rule number three, do everything number two says. He said, we're not going to get those hearing aids. And she says, oh, yes, we are. And he said, Wayne, that's the best pair of hearing aids I've ever had. I said, for $3,500, they better be, huh? And he said, yeah. And he said, you know what I caught myself doing? I kept going, huh, out of habit. Out of habit. You see, sometimes we say things out of habit. Where I'm from, they love to do this. Bree, Bree just gets aggravated and then she starts talking like them and then I laugh. But it's a habit. It's a habit we get into. The third sign, he's healed the layman's son. Or the layman, I'm sorry, the lame man. We studied this a week ago Wednesday. The thing that upset the Pharisees and the Sadducees wasn't that the guy was healed as much as what? He healed him. On the Sabbath day. And what did he tell him? He told him, rise, get up, take your bed and walk. Which proves that he's got power over birth defects. He's got power over birth defects. Now, let me go back to something I, I was trying to say Wednesday night, a week ago, and I don't think I made it very clear. So let me try to catch you up, so to speak. It's amazing to me how people hold on to some beliefs. And I, I've told some of you this before, and those who haven't heard it, bear with me. I go to see this woman who had a baby, gorgeous baby. Only trouble was she had a cleft palate. I just learned the other day that if you don't put a key on your belly, 
during the eclipse, you're gonna, your baby's going to have a cleft palate. I didn't know that. See, I learned something Monday morning. And, and uh, so anyhow, I don't know. We didn't have an eclipse that year. And so I was just, man, I was just, oh, man, God bless, praise the Lord, that baby, look. And there was some people that were yeah. there, and I said, well, look, I, I'm, I'm not going to bother you guys. I just want to come by and say hi. And gorgeous baby, and she said, can you stick around a minute? I thought, uh oh, what did I do now? And so the others left, and she said, Dwayne, why does God hate me? I said, beg pardon? She said, why does God hate me? I said, God doesn't hate you. Why do you think God hates you? Well, look at my baby. By the way, they did plastic surgery. You wouldn't have known she had it. She's a, she's a healthy girl. She's got, I think, three kids and, and husband, and they're doing great. But where do we hold on to these things? I know where we hang on to these things. The devil reminds us of these things. And so we hang on to things that make us feel better. And John 5, 17 to 21 proves he's deity. Because what did he do? He didn't do anything special in the sense that, oh, he he got out these hot water bottles and and man, he he was like a chiropractor. No offense, doc. You know, he, he was like a chiropractor and he worked and he worked and he worked and he worked and it took about two weeks for that to kick in. No, none of that right. When he told that man to get up, take up your bed and walk, the thing that got their attention was what? It was on the Sabbath. For sign, he fed approximately 5,000, probably fed closer to 30,000 people with five loaves and two fish. And, Beth and he's at Beth Bethsaida. I always want to say Bethesda. That's not right. Bethsaida. And he fed these people with five loaves and two fish. And John's my favorite account in this because Philip is, you know, the disciples just saw all these people just as annoying. They did. You know, they're trying to crowd the territory. They shouldn't be trying to crowd the territory. They should be trying, you know, they, they, uh, that's our positions. And Jesus said, when when Philip says, Jesus, you need to send them down so they can get something to eat. Jesus says, nah, you don't need to send them down. You feed them. And Philip goes, Lord, how are we going to feed all these people? 500 or 200 denarii worth of bread wouldn't feed these people. Jesus said, what do you got? Five loaves and two fish. And boy, it was tight. I'm telling you, it was so tight, Jesus was sweating, and he didn't even know if he had enough food there or not. That's what we want to believe. When they got full, everybody got full, and they got their belly full. And I'm not talking about, about just eating enough. I'm talking about like we have a potluck, you know. We eat and going, oh, my golly. Or at a gospel meeting, it's a 20-pound gospel meeting. You know, you gain 20 pounds during the week. Jesus said, go pick up the baskets of fragments. Historians said these baskets were tw uh, 24 gallons tall. They picked up 12. And Jesus knew these guys, still didn't know who he was, because on another occasion, he said, you only stick around with me because you got your belly full. You see, he controls the food supply. Oh, when I hear people talk about the water drying up, most of what they say is right. Do they ever notice why the water's drying up? Do they ever take the time to notice why the food's drying up? I'm talking about in the United States. It's because what's happening with the United States with God? Think about that for a little bit. If he can make enough water come out of a rock to feed two and a half million people plus all their livestock, and he did it more than once. You see, you can't convince me. You can't convince me that God is not in control. 
He is the bread of life, John 6, 35. He's the water of life, John 4. And he's the only one that satisfies. And so you go to the fifth sign, and then this is one of my favorite too. I like Matthew's account the best, but we'll stay with John. When he walks on the water. You see, he's on the Sea of Galilee. And what happened simply was the wind started getting up, as it always will do. And Jesus has to get away from them. He's got to go spend time with his father. He's got to spend time in prayer. And when he spends time in prayer, what does he do? He comes down at about three o'clock in the morning and he sees them. And he sees what they're going through and he knows what they're going through. And he doesn't do like we would think. You see, we think what he should do is like Bill Cosby explained that time on Rolling in the Roller Coaster. He said, you always told your mother, because what she would do is fly up and save you and go home and cook dinner, man. That's what you want. But Jesus is watching them. They're straining to row at this, and they are, they, they're scared to death. And in the middle of this storm, Jesus walks on water toward them. Mark said they thought it was a ghost. Now, I, I have a, a dumb question, not because you're dumb. Does anybody think that these 12 men didn't know what Jesus looked like? Does anybody know what think these 12 men didn't know what Jesus sounded like? And when he walked by and they screamed out, he says, don't be afraid. It's I. What did Peter do? You see, he's got to reassert his number two position. And what does he do? Lord, if it is you, now, wasn't that an oxymoron? Lord, if it's you, permit me to come to you. And Jesus says, come on. And Peter's walking. And he's walking toward the Lord because he's got his eyes focused on the Lord. And then unfortunately, to Peter, reality set in. You see, that storm didn't quit. I grew up thinking that storm stopped. I grew up thinking that rain had quit. I grew up thinking that boat being tossed to and fro had stopped. No, uh-uh. But I'm partial to John at the end of it. Because when Jesus saved Peter when he sunk, and they saw where they were, they were right at land. One of my favorite quotes, and I cannot remember who said it first. I'd love to give him credit for it. God will launch you into the deep, but he will never let you drown. God will launch you into the deep, but he'll never let you drown. He's still the creator. It wasn't bothering him a bit. How about when the, when the blind man we looked at Wednesday night? He's doing this in Jerusalem again on the Sabbath day. And John 8, 12 and John 9, 5 say the same thing. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. John 8, 12 just says, I'm the light of the world. And aren't we glad we have light? Let me tell you something else that always fascinates me. You know, you looked at that, that uh, sun through your welding glasses or your special glasses and, and, and all. You know that thing's 93 million miles away? And you can't look at it with your naked eye? I'm very picky, picky about my eyes because of my heritage. And so I wear shades frequently. I buy prescription shades, as a matter of fact. Because I don't want that sun to damage my eyes any more than it's already been damaged. But isn't it amazing? Especially here, I notice it here more than I do it back at home. Isn't it amazing how nice it feels? And it can be 40 degrees outside. The other day, it was so nice. And as soon as we got home, about 30 minutes after we got home, man, a lot of that sun went down and started feeling like, ooh, got your attention. 
Nobody questions if the sun's going to come up in the east, or goes down in the west. I saw something very beautiful, and it was one of the things that I, I, I treasured this morning, and that is the moon was up until I got home, and the moon was right over here, and it was starting to turn yellow and starting to go to bed, and I said, I'm going to join you, moon. That was a quarter of five. See, Jesus is the light of the world, and we all want light. Light, or excuse me, darkness is the absence of light. You can be, that sun out there can be, you can be working on something. And that sun's out there and you still got to have light. One of the things that I inherited from my dad and my kids don't like is the fact that I always tell them, will you please put that light where I can see? And then Bree sent me a TikTok thing a while back and I went, mm-hmm, same thing. Jesus is the light of the world. We need light. And of course, the last sign, at least, that we know is this one. We usually hear this one at a funeral, and it's appropriate. But we should think of it more while we live, too. Jesus has been told, don't go to Jerusalem. Don't go to Jerusalem. Bethany's not too far, about 12 miles from there. And Mary and Martha send to Jesus, said, Lazarus, you're the one you love. The one you love is sick. And then Jesus said, oh, he's sleeping. Well, the 12 think what he's talking about is he went to bed. John says he died. And Jesus stayed two more days. And at the two more days, Jesus said, I'm glad I wasn't there so that the glory of God could be revealed for you. And Martha's the first one. Poor Martha, we get on her case sometimes, but we're just like her. And Martha starts chewing the Lord out. She said, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? I know, I know he, he, he'll rise one day. That isn't what Jesus said. See what I said a while ago, a few minutes ago? We don't believe Jesus when he talks sometimes. Here's the Lord. The one who broke the bottle or is going to break the bottle of that costly perfume. And Judas is going to get upset because he had charge of the money. He said, we could have used that to feed the poor. That wasn't what he wanted to do. He was taking it. He was taking and stealing from the money box. And she walked up to him. Mary walked up to him and chewed him out. Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he dies, will live. Do you believe this? I know he'll live one day. That isn't what Jesus said. And by the way, when Mary was mourning and she runs to see Jesus, they all follow everybody. A big old crowd follows her. And Jesus says, show me where the tomb is. Now I want you to stop for a minute. If he knows he's dead, he knows where he's buried. So why would Jesus say that? Because he wants us to respond to him. And so what does he do? Or what do they do? They take him to the tomb. And then Jesus says something else. Roll away the stone. <laughs> he turned around. Lord, we can't do that. Do you understand that he's been dead four days and he's going to smell? The stench is going to be so bad? And Jesus wouldn't take no for an answer. 
Now, hang on a second. Let me ask you a second question. Do you think that if Jesus knew he was dead and he knew where he was buried, do you think Jesus didn't have the ability to roll that stone away? But he's not going to do for us what we can do for him. What I mean by that is we have the ability to do what he says to do. And so they rolled the stone away. I, I don't know. I can't prove it. Because you don't read in there, ooh, the smell. And I'm not going to try to get too gross here. But I have picked up a fellow who hung himself and he was out in the sun for 18 hours. It was very difficult to get back to Silver City for 60 miles. I'll just leave it at that. And nobody said anything about the smell. Nobody said anything. Everybody's looking at Jesus. Aha. Aha. Isn't that what he wants? For you and me to look at Jesus? <laughs> and Jesus does the unthinkable. He doesn't go in the tomb. He doesn't go anywhere just close enough for Lazarus to hear these words. Lazarus, come forth. And I know I think about modern news sometimes when it comes to this. Can you just imagine what that would have been like on Fox, The Hill, News Nation, CNN, all ABC, NBC, CBS, when Lazarus came out in his grave clothes. And then Jesus tells him to do one more thing. Let him go. Loose him. Now, for you and for you, that may be kind of ugh. For me, I'd walked up there and done it. But remember, they're thinking about one thing. You don't touch a dead body. And Jesus says he's not dead. Because he has power over life and death. That's what 1 Corinthians 15, 26 says. The last enemy to be destroyed is not going to be the devil. The last enemy to be destroyed is not going to be sin. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Did you hear that? Last enemy to be destroyed. Death is always our enemy. You see, it's the result of sin. It's the wages of sin. It's separation from God. And we need God. And folks, Jesus came and the seven signs John just showed us are all about Jesus. And when he says back in Matthew 12, I think I said John 12 last a couple of weeks ago. I want to correct that. Matthew 12, the only sign that will be given to this generation is where he will be lifted between the ground and the sky. He will be on a cross. And he hung there for six hours one Friday. He hung there so that you and I might have eternal life. So that you and I might have the hope that God intended for all of us. To restore the relationship that we severed in the garden. I think about he's uh, this is long ago, but he's now one of the elders of the church near home. But he cheated on his wife. And he shouldn't have. He admitted it to his wife and his family, admitted it to the church family. 
And because she was so hurt and so cut, so cut to the heart, she made him date her and take her out and then went overboard. But their relationship is restored. I think about that in relationship to you and me. You see, if we didn't, we didn't go very far in this. We severed the relationship. And what does God want? He wants to restore it. That's why we put in the bullets and what must I do to be saved and what must I do to stay saved is to be faithful to death and you'll be given, not earned, given a crown of life. You'll be given the victory. And it's all because he loved us first. First John 4, 19. So we love him. And if you're here this morning, we're going to sing 207 as a means of encouragement this morning, 207. If you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, not ours, the Lord's, please let us know while we sing. Hark the gentle voice of Jesus fall tenderly upon your ear. Sweet his cry of love and pity call up, turn and listen, stay and hear. Ye shepherd and are heavy laden lean upon your dear lord's breast ye that labor and are heavy laden come and i will give you rest take his yoke for he is meek and lowly bear his burden to him turn he who calleth is the master holy he will teach if you will learn Ye that labor and are heavy laden, lean upon your dear Lord's breast. Ye that labor and are heavy laden, come and I will give you rest. Then his tender, tender voice obeying, bear his yoke, his burden take. Find the yoke, his hand is on you, laying light and easy for his sake. Ye that labor and are heavy laden, lean upon your dear Lord's breast. Ye that labor and are heavy laden, come and I will give you rest. 208. And then we'll be dismissed in prayer. 208, please make plans to be here tonight for potluck. And we always have a good time. And uh, please make plans to be here for that. Is the grandest theme through the ages rung. Tis the grandest theme for a mortal tongue. Tis the grandest theme that the world e'er sung. Our God is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. Though by sin oppressed, go to him for rest. Our God is able to deliver thee. Tis the grandest theme, let the tidings roll to the guilty heart, to the sinful soul. Look to God in faith, he will make thee whole. Our God is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee though by sin oppressed go to him for rest our god is able to deliver thee and father we thank you you're able to deliver us you're willing to deliver us and it's a fact that one day your people will be delivered home overwhelms us to think how you will be how we will be presented before you how we'll be with our elder brother in that presentation and how people, our loved ones that are with you, will look forward to that reunion in the sky. Father, thank you for Jesus and thank you for the life that he lived, the example he set, for the death he died, for the resurrection that he lives, 
and that he is now seated at your right hand to make intercession for us. That is through whom we ask for the forgiveness of our sins, and it's in his name that we pray, Jesus. Amen. Thank y'all for being here this morning. Have a good week, my dear. You too. Talk to you later. I hope